Thank you, TJ, and thank you, Derek, for inviting me. I'm really, it's, uh, this is the audience I wanted to speak to. It's, uh, it's really exciting for me to be here because, um, to date, the best audience, the most interesting audience I had was at the Naval Academy where I was, uh, my book was assigned to the environmental security class and I was invited to speak to them. And, um, you know, what really struck me uh, is how uh, focused the Navy has been from the very beginning uh, on a science basis on climate change. And uh, they've been the opposite of climate change deniers. They've been way out ahead of the curve. They were the first to understand the strategic implications of rising sea levels and uh, melting ice in the Arctic. And I'd like to encourage you to think, I mean, I'm gonna be talking mostly about, about sonar and, and, and the Navy, and, and, but really I'd, li I'd encourage you to think about the broader issue of, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that too, of noise pollution in the ocean, because really I think that's the strategic uh, interest that the Navy has in, in solving this sort of debacle they've, they've been in for a while. Um, I assume I've been really impressed by the sort of candor and openness of the conversation here, so I assume I've been invited here because I might have something to say having spent six and seven years sort of uh, looking at this from all, all angles and talking to a lot of people and giving it a lot of thought. So I'm going to give you my candid uh, thoughts on how you can move forward perhaps in a, in a constructive way on this front. And um, um, so, you know, I've also, I just want to say, I've been really uh, gratified by how the Navy has reached out to me, readers, you know, since the book came out last summer, aside from the Academy. And here I've been, uh, I've gotten lots of uh, outreach from retired uh, fleet officers, acousticians, sonar operators with really specific suggestions about what could be done, not just with sonar to mitigate uh, the risks of sonar, but on sound issues in general. And that's something I, I really look forward to after, I, I, after my comments to discussing with you, because that you, you folks are the technical experts and, and of course know the Navy and the Navy culture better than I do. So um, I'm gonna share some of the, the ideas I've gotten from Navy people, largely Navy people, and you can tell me if any of them are feasible in your mind. Um, I, I want to start by just posing the obvious question, which is what do, what do whales have to do with maritime uh, power and international security? And I invite you to consider the proposition that the fate of the whales is integral to the, to the central mission of the Navy uh, in terms of national defense. And, and here's why I say that. Uh, for the past 20 years, the Navy has been bogged down in illegal trench warfare with environmentalists, uh, really largely with one environmental group, Natural Resources Defense Council, and one, one attorney, uh, Joel Reynolds. And, uh, you know, if this were a battlefield situation, I think there would have been a different outcome, but I think this is really a cultural clash between the military and the environmentalists where there's, it's tough for both sides, though in individual cases there have been plenty of settlements. And I think uh, despite the Navy prevailing, in, a, in a, one of the cases went to the Supreme Court in 2008 and the Navy prevailed. However, uh, and I think the Navy expressed to me at the time that the admirals who I was interviewing saying, well, finally we're, we're, we're done with death by injunction. Uh, but that hasn't proven to be the case. We're back in, uh, the Navy is back in court. They've been sued and are back in court. Uh, uh, on, on via alleged violations of uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, other environmental laws on their California and Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian ranges. And there's a decision due out, sort of hoping it would be, be out by today. In the next couple of days or next week, you might watch for it. It probably won't be on the front page of the New York Times, but if you set a Google alert, you'll hear about it. And, uh, and there's no way to predict how it's gonna go, but historically, the Navy has lost all but one of the cases. The one case, which was a fairly narrow ruling that they took up to the Supreme Court, they did prevail in a, in a, in a uh, split decision, but they did prevail. Um, but in other cases, the, uh, the judges have enjoined, you know, issued injunctions that have delayed uh, deployment of strategic sonar systems and other acoustic warfare systems. And they have um, also delayed training and certification of, of, of sailors and, and battle groups that were going overseas to uh, war zones. Uh, the two simple examples of that is uh, the low frequency active sonar has been delayed. I mean, the uh, Navy's only been able to deploy it in one area in the China Sea. They wanted to have permission to deploy it all around the world, and that was delayed for 
15 years, and uh, during the 2004 RIMPAC exercises, a, a judge uh, ruled on, in NRDC's favor and, and uh, enjoined the Navy and eight navies from, from moving forward, and they had to idle there in the Hawaiian waters for eight days until they came to a settlement with, with NRDC about what mitigations they were gonna use. So these are real, these are not just courtroom dramas, I guess is my point. Um, meanwhile, in the court of public opinion, which also counts, uh, the Navy's been uh, on the defensive fighting a rear guard action against environmental and animal rights groups uh, who have been very adept at exploiting uh, images of, you know, kind of grotesque images of, of whales on beaches with blood coming out of their eyes. And, um, I'm going to share some of those images with you. You may have seen them, but in case you haven't, I think it is useful to see what the rest of the world is, is, is looking at. And, um, you know, when it comes to public relations war, uh, you're, you're uh, outgunned and uh, out unlikely to prevail on that front, I think. And, uh, I mean, the Navy does have some PR sites. They have a Facebook page about all the good things they're doing with marine mammals. but. Um, I actually did a, a media metrics check and there isn't much traffic there and there are lots of sites that are circulating other information on the other side. Um, so the bottom line there is the Navy, whales should matter to the Navy because they matter to a lot of people. Um, I was talking to General Howe, I gave him a copy of the book before he had to leave today and he said, oh, my wife's a big whale tiger, she'll love this book and she's always giving me a hard time about the Navy and sonar. And so even if you folks who, you know, in your somewhat tribal uh, community of the Navy are sort of all on one side of the issue, that doesn't represent uh, the country as a whole. And uh, that's part of what my book is about. Um, also, you know, unfortunately, the, the focus, the public focus on sonar has really overshadowed an otherwise very impressive environmental record by the Navy in terms of developing novel biofuels and recycling at sea programs. But, you know, I think the Navy has allowed itself in some ways to be tarred by this brush of, you know, being a heedless steward of the environment, which is neither accurate nor, of course, desirable. Um, so, and it also distracts attention from the primary sources of, of, of industrial noise pollution that are really what are endangering marine mammals, uh, you know, more than these acute uh, local episodes where whales are driven ashore. So this brings me to the most important reason the Navy should be paying close attention uh, to whales, and that is that they are the bellwether of probably the most important uh, change in the, in, in the global ocean climate, or one of the most important, I think, and that's the rising tide of, of ambient noise from industrial sources in the ocean. Those are 95% of it is, is oil and gas exploration and drilling and uh, international shipping. And um, these are, um, I think I have a slide I can go to. So, I mean, this is just an overview of them and it's not proportional, but that's just kind of what's out in the ocean. And, and, and my point is that it's not, I mean, so you have uh, uh, seismic air guns. Uh, sorry, these are some of those nasty images. We go to, so seismic air guns are, are uh, crisscrossing uh, oceans looking for oil and, and letting off, uh, you know, these, these very compressed, very loud air cannons. You might know what they sound like every six seconds for hours and they ricochet around and uh, bad for local wildlife, needless to say. And uh, this is how many of them there are around. It's the loudest industrial noise in the ocean. It's about 256 decibels, I think, at the source these days. So you can imagine that that noise radiating out is a lot of ambient noise. And, um, and then, then there's international shipping, which, you know, you have these enormous tankers, and there are tens of thousands, of, there are thousands of those super tankers, I'm sorry, cargo ships on the, on the water, and tankers, and super tankers, and large ships with a lot of propeller cavitation. And, um, and these have a really, uh, needless to say, negative impact on marine mammals. I won't go through all the, the problems, but I mean, in addition, you know, these, are, these, these chronic sources are not driving them onto beaches, but they're stressing these populations, and not just marine mammals. Uh, fish, uh, fish catch goes down about 40% in the presence of, of chronic noise. Uh, even coral has been shown to wither in the face of chronic noise. So all marine life is very sensitive, and you know, we, can, we can identify with that. You know? it's, uh, 
And we're all sensitive to noise. It's stressful, it brings down productivity rates, everything is bad about it. And most importantly for this conversation is, it's, uh, it's bad for the Navy. Uh, the Navy's always battled the problem of acoustic clutter in terms of, uh, particularly in ASW. And so, um, you know, the Navy and the whales are very much bedfellows in this, in this conundrum. And um, I don't have to explain all the ways this makes it harder for the Navy to, um, to do both passive and acoustic work in the, in the, in the, in the ocean. And for the, uh, for the marine mammals, it's, it's been called acoustic smog. And, um, and it's, they're choking on it. <laughs> so um, this is just one most recent example uh, of, of how both whales and, and the Navy are being uh, impeded, if you will, by, by industrial noise in the ocean. This is a map of the proposed permit uh, sales that the, the Interior Department released this sum last summer and is now about to be sold to oil and gas companies. This is after a 27-year moratorium on oil and gas on the East Coast. And actually, it's just the southern half of this initially. But any of you who, who are involved in, in the Atlantic will recognize that that's exactly on top of the sonar and explosive training range of the Navy. And um, I don't have to tell you how hard it will be for the Navy to operate on that range with seismic air guns going off and pile driving of rigs and then oil and gas. And that's the reason the Navy has actually testified a couple of years ago in front of Congress opposing this. Uh, but the, the Interior Department and its wisdom has, has okayed it. So there is gonna, this is going to be the next legal battlefront. And the good news for you is it's a possible distraction for the same environmentalists who are taking you to court. Not a distraction, but another front. Let me put it that way. So um, the, my kind of overarching message, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the kind of background of the story and um, how you got here and you know, maybe some, some choices that were made along the way that might inform choices going forward. And, um, but my overarching thing is that the Navy needs to be a part of the solution. If there's going to be a mitigation reduction of noise levels in the ocean, the ocean, obviously oil and gas are not going to go away, uh, shipping are not going away. But what they need, what those industries need, is technology and innovation. And that's what the Navy does best. And you guys invented ship quieting, um, noise isolation. Uh, you guys are the leader in satellite telemetry to map the bottoms of the ocean. I know there are some people who know about that. Um, and the reason, interestingly, your partner at ONR is partnered with Phillips Conoco on that, on that effort. And it's pretty remarkable to look and see how much of what they're doing all these air gun arrays, seismic tests with, they can do with microwaves from a satellite. So um, hopefully the Navy will continue to support that and move forward on that front because air guns are bad. I mean, you know, in the Arctic down here, wherever it is. So, um, you know, I think the Navy needs to be a part of the solution. I was struck by the parallels to the search and rescue operations uh, panel yesterday. They were saying, you know, the the irreplaceable role of navies in, in that effort uh, because they have the assets and, and, and so do you in this one. And it's, I, I really do believe it's a self-interested uh, path to take. Okay, so let me uh, give you a real sprint through a, a sort of a, a look back at how we got here and uh, some of this you may know but I suspect there's a lot that you don't. So I called this book War of the Whales because, again, it really is a culture war. And it's a culture war between two sides of the American culture that um, both care deeply about whales and the ocean, but for very different reasons. On one side, you have, of course, the Navy, which, going back to the beginning of the Cold War, had a really dire need to see in the dark ocean and to, um, to be able to navigate in the dark ocean and to hunt uh, the Soviet submarine armada. And they used mostly sound, both passive and active, to do that. And it was the Navy that turned to uh, dolphins and other small whales and other marine mammals to help them in this effort. And that effort has continued to today. Um, they went to these animals. I mean, that's one of the real ironies of the situation, is that the, the Navy has spent a lot of time studying, training, trying to de-reverse uh, engineer uh, a cetacean biosonar because it's so sensitive and so acute. And 
That's why they're driven onto the beaches by mid-frequency sonar, and that's why they can't handle uh, acoustic smog. And so the very reason you've chosen to partner with them, they can find mines, they can patrol harbors, they can retrieve objects from the deep ocean. So on the other side of this cultural divide is a generation, the same generation of Americans who grew up being introduced to these animals as lovable friends and adorable uh, creatures in marine parks and then later in the, in the wild, in their natural settings, and uh, you know, more and more seeking these close encounters uh, with these very charismatic animals. And um, these are the same generation that you know, were either passive or actively supporting the Save the Whale movement that eventually ended with a, a, a commercial ban on, on whaling in 1986. So, what I discovered is, when I dug deeper into it, is that really what's so interesting, and again ironic, is there, before there was this cultural divide, there was only one culture that cared about whales. Uh, certain, uh, well, there were two. One was in 1946, let's go back to 1946, uh, World War II is over, ONR was just founded, and so was the International Whaling Commission, because lo and behold, the whaling stocks had crashed because the whaling industry had wildly over harvested them with industrial uh, techniques in search of important commodities like brake fluid and dog food. And um, at the time, though, nobody else cared, except they were, they were desperately trying to revive those stocks. But the only other people who, who cared about the whales and thought of them as anything other than a commodity, a floating vat of oil, was um, the US Navy. And that's because uh, the Navy took notice that in, in 1940, there was a biologist, an undergraduate at Harvard uh, named Donald Griffin, who in the basement of a Harvard laboratory finally solved the Spallanzani problem, which was the mystery of how whales, na um, sorry, how, how bats hunt and navigate in the dark. And they, of course, used ultrasonic sound, but they hadn't been able to hear the ultrasonic sound before. So the ONR reached out and hired him immediately, recruited him to their efforts. And he, was, he worked with them the rest of his career. And what he opined was that perhaps other uh, mammals that navigate in the dark use what he had dubbed echolocation. And uh, he said, perhaps whales are doing this. So the Navy, there were no whales. The important thing to understand is there were no whale scientists at the time. There was no marine mammology as a discipline. There were no cetologists. I mean, there were only whalers who had only done some observational work. So the Navy sent. Uh, the, it's acousticians, it's zoologists, it's veterinarians down to marine land in the Pacific, which was the world's, uh, the country's first marine park in St. Augustine, Florida. And they um, were able very quickly to study these animals and determine that in fact they were using echolocation and that their biosonar, which it soon became called, was outdistanced anything that the Navy could touch. And it's not surprising if you think about it. These animals have evolved in different habitats, but generally in the ocean, dark ocean depths, to hunt and navigate uh, for 30 to 40 million years. So um, I won't go into the technology, but the Navy was very interested in deconstructing this technology. And these animals were also trainable. So the Navy um, began training them to do, again, deep ops recovery and mine sweeping, which they totally outdistance human minesweepers. They, I, I won't tell you the wonderful, you can read the book, you'll see the cool things they, they figured out they could do. So here's where the story kind of takes a left turn. So again, the Navy reached out to people like John Lilly. John Lilly is a neurologist at NIH. He was famous for doing the first cortical maps of macaque monkeys. And if you've ever seen those horrifying pictures of these macaque monkeys with no skull flap and 100 electrodes. And he heard about these big, bigger-brained animals down in St. Augustine, and he got very interested in these animals. And he's the person who gave this vision to the Navy that these people, these, sorry, these creatures who are, are so acoustically sensitive and communicative and social could be great allies. And he laid out in a book he wrote called Man and Dolphin, which is also a popular book. So he did a popular book to the public and to the Navy. He was explaining all the things that they could do in, in combat situations. So they set him up with a communications lab. He went off the deep end and started doing um, experiments with LSD and dolphins, which was legal at the time. A lot of scientists were doing LSD and psilocybin experiments in academic settings. 
but he was cohabitating and the researchers were taking acid. And in any case, he eventually released his, his research animals. Well, it was, it was it's, I mean, it is so funny, but it was an embarrassment to this fledgling discipline. So the Navy had set up this discipline, which now had convened and they had called, decided we're gonna call ourselves marine mammologists. And he was one of the really important early guys. He was doing serious work, and then he went in this direction. He was using ketamine with LSD by the end, and he was in astral conversations with them and trying to decode their language. And in any case, um, he went on to be a, an avatar of the New Age. He retired to California and Esalen and, and Hawaii and continued to write on this topic, but not for the Navy. Um, another person whose name you might know, Roger Payne, was a ONR researcher into owls. He was investigating whether owls echolocate. In fact, they don't, though they, they just have very acute eyesight. Uh, they do not use sound to hunt at night. But he heard about whales. He, went, he, he heard about uh, these endangered humpback whales that were in Bermuda. And he actually connected with a, 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 a Navy sonar operator, the guy who, who actually uh, operated the very first uh, SOSA station in the Bermuda. And he um, handed over to Payne these tapes which he had been making with SOSIS receivers. And Roger Payne, who was actually a musician by training, a classical musician, convinced a, a record company to make a long playing album called Song of the Humpback Whales that went on to become one of the best selling albums in 1970, in the same year that uh, Grateful Dead's uh, American Beauty, Abbey Road. It was a good year for music. I've listened to this, I'm, I'm not playing for it because it doesn't sound like music. However, it caught the imagination of, of the, the culture and people were ready for that and it became a bit, very big deal and it really enshrined, what it did was it restored the whales to this mythic stature they'd had up until recent times. I mean, they used to have a lot of clout in the, in the mythic realm, but then they had been reduced to a commodity by the whaling age, but now they were back. And finally, there was Paul Spong, who was another neuroscientist and a disciple or a co colleague of, of, of John Lilly's, who was the first person to work with orcas, captive orcas at the Vancouver Aquarium. And he very quickly decided these animals were not suitable for, for captive research and released them. Well, he didn't release them. He was released by the Vancouver Aquarium. They held on to their whales. And he set up a research station nearby in the, in, in, off of Vancouver Island. But what he's notable for is he went to Greenpeace, which had just, at the time, was working to protest above ground nuclear explosions tests. And he convinced them that they should redirect their f fire and video cameras at the uh, Soviet whaling fleet, which they did. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but there was a time during uh, the wide world of sports, if you remember that show, where it was a weekly installment where they were following uh, the Rainbow Warrior and, and as they followed the, the Russian fleet. And Walter Conkright used a clip of them uh, getting like carpooned almost by the, by the uh, Russians, and it was a big deal. So meanwhile, on the other side of the divide, you do have uh, the Navy that's, that's, that is moving forward, continuing to use this. So they were deployed, as you may know, in Vietnam, and Cameron Bay is mostly in harbor patrol. But then in the, in the mid-'80s, I think 87, they were deployed in Bahrain to patrol harbors there, and um, they're still being used overseas. They don't do particularly well in waters that are not natural to them, but the Navy has belugas they've trained for, for cold water, and they use pilot whales in other settings, and sea lions, but they call them these their wet brain assets. And even though, and they're, you know, at, at great expense and with a fair amount of flack from uh, animal rights people, they continue to use them. And the reason is that um, the dolphin drones, which are, these are AUVs, this is an early generation of Remus that was built at Woods Hole, were, very much built on what they had gleaned from their uh, biosonar research over decades. And they continue to upgrade them, but as refined as they've gotten, they only operate on flat bottom surfaces. Um, they have malfunction, of course, and they're just, they still can't touch what dolphins can do. Dolphins can find objects buried eight feet in the mud. They can tell the difference between a ball bearing and of copper and zinc from 100 feet away. I mean, it's sort of remarkable. So. Um, they, they, they've kept them uh, engaged. So uh, let's jump forward 10 years to 1995. The Cold War is over. Um, 
Joel Reynolds is the lead head attorney at the uh, Los Angeles Office of Natural Resources Defense Council, also known as NRDC. And somebody called him uh, about uh, the ship shock trials that were being scheduled, uh, I think, for the John Paul Jones. And um, they were worried about the marine life in the area because the, the Navy, in its judgment, had decided to conduct these 10,000 pound explosive trials in, um, inside the Santa Barbara Marine Sanctuary. So um, Joel Reynolds had never done an ocean case before, never done a marine mammal case before. He had done some terrestrial, um, he mostly was sort of trying to slow down development, commercial development in California, and he, he did endangered species stuff. But he knew a winning case when he saw one, so he went to court and uh, the Navy refused to settle, and the judge said, I don't like the look of this, and you should settle, and the Navy didn't want to settle, and so then she said, you can't do them, and, you know, and again, enjoined them from carrying this out, and so the Navy finally agreed to take them out to a deeper ocean where there is much less marine life, and that's where they've been conducted ever since. But following on the heels of that reputation for taking on the Navy, he was next approached by other groups um, over the Heard Island experiment, ATOC. Does anyone know what that is? Has anyone ever heard of that? Anyway, one of the most, I won't go into in detail, but the, one of the Navy's greatest oceanog physical oceanographers, Walter Monk, had come up with this very elegant idea for testing uh, global climate change in the, in the form of uh, uh, temperature change in the ocean. And what he did is he found this place in the South Indian Ocean called Heard Island, it's an uninhabited island, where you could create an acoustic ray path to every continent and country in the world. And what he did was he borrowed a ship from the Navy because he was in with the Navy and it was doing other work for the Jasons and whatnot. Um, that was being used, as it turned out, for low frequency active sea tests, and it had a very strong uh, transducer th uh, lower through the hull. And in any case, he, um, he was able, and, and it was a successful experiment. It proved, I mean, the sound signal arrived simultaneously at the east and west coast, and his idea was if we leave it on for 10 years, that we will be able to measure the, the warming of the oceans because, of course, as the ocean warms up, the speed at which it travels from here to various places will increase. So it was very elegant and simple, but as brilliant as Walter Monk is, he's still active in his mid-90s, he was sort of had a blind spot around the biological level of the ocean, and it was after the Cold War, and these uh, whale groups were getting activated, and they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it, in fact, uh, they were, this was in violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, the um, National Environmental Protection Act, all of which were passed in 1972 in the last days of the Nixon administration, and Nixon signed them. And um, all through the Cold War, the Navy had observed them in the breach. So now, the reason they heard about, the, that anyone heard about this experiment is that um, it was a dual-use experiment. It wasn't disclosed at the time, but the Navy's interest in this experiment, if you look at this, photo, this diagram, was this promised to give them the sort of the holy grail of acoustic warfare, which was a synoptic map of the oceans, where they could sort of imagine as a great sonogram of the oceans, where you could see everything moving in the ocean. And so they loved this idea, so they funded it. And, um, but unfortunately for the Navy, uh, Joel Reynolds, uh, was able, well, he threatened to take them to court, at which point they agreed to make the first part of the, of the uh, project uh, looking at the effect on whales and marine mammals, and whales started coming ashore. So they, it kind of, it continued in another form, but it was somewhat obstructed. So it was in the course of the settlement negotiations over ATOC that Joel Reynolds got wind of a um, classified a Navy program. It was really a legacy program from the Cold War. It was a beyond the horizon active sonar. This was after SOSIS had been kind of eclipsed by the Soviet ship quieting. And um, it used the same boat that, that, as I mentioned, it was the Cory Chuest. And as you can see, there was a, there was a bunch of really big uh, speakers because the idea is this was a, a long distance beyond the horizon. So it took enormous amounts of acoustic energy. And um, so 
In any case, Joel Reynolds said, listen, this is not in compliance with the law, and you haven't applied for permits from NOAA and, and National Marine Fisheries, which is they're required to do. So they, they agreed to a, apply for the permits, and in the meantime, they also agreed, the Navy agreed to do the first environmental impact statement for these kinds of uh, sound experiments or, or subsequently exercises. So those went on for years and years, and in the meantime, uh, Reynolds and other scientists started looking at, at, at strandings that were occurring uh, and probably had been occurring but hadn't been noticed. And, th and there was one notable one in Greece in 1996, again during uh, NATO uh, joint exercises in deep underwater canyons off of uh, the, in the Ionian Sea and then later in Madeira and the Canary Islands. And these images started appearing, but um, for better or for worse, these specimens no one, the Navy didn't investigate them and, and the local veterinarians were not able to reach them for days and the, the specimens were in a state of decay where it was ambiguous um, why they'd come ashore. But it's, it's worth noting, this is a species of whale. They're beaked whales. Beaked whales are actually 25% of all whale species, but because they're such deep divers, spend so much time underground, most, underwater, sorry, most people don't, uh, see them or know them other than marine biologists. But in any case, this species of whale, unlike others, never strands live. I mean, it's just some species strand all the time. This one doesn't, so it was anomalous. So Reynolds went to the scientists and said, you know, you should start looking into this, and I may need you as an expert witness someday. And uh, these scientists, number one, didn't want to get involved in a, in a lawsuit. Surprise, surprise. And, and secondly, they're in the pay of the Navy. I mean, the Navy still, was the only major sponsor. National uh, Science Foundation got involved by the late 90s, but really most marine mammal biologists of any stripe and acousticians, bioacousticians, either were directly or indirectly employed by the Navy. So uh, they just wanted to hang out with the whales, and you can see why. It's, a good, it's good work if you can get it. So, um, so this so, so things kind of tilted back. The, the Navy was still working. They were about to, to, to apply for their permits. They completed their EIS. And in March of 2000, uh, the George Washington Battle Group, I believe, was um, scheduled to have its COM2X exercises in Vieques. And as you may know, Vieques at that point is when the Navy can no longer operate in Vieques because of environmental damage and protests by the islanders, and so they were looking for a new place to operate. And they decided to go to the deepest underwater canyon in the world. They had a, a lab down there in Autech uh, in the Bahamas. And they were somewhat familiar, they had mapped the waters. Unfortunately, they didn't do a marine mammal survey. And uh, if they had, they would have known that there was a well-studied population of uh, beaked whales that had been there for 20 to 25 million years, depending on uh, the aging uh, method used. And they also would have found out that a former Navy pilot and sonar officer, uh, Ken Balcom, who worked, who was in, did two tours in the Navy in the 60s and early 70s, was in Vietnam and Japan, um, had become a whale scientist and was a field researcher there and had been there every winter for 10 years studying this this population of, of whales. So this is, from a writer's point of view, why you love this story. It's too good to be true. So it was a nightmare for the, for the Navy, but for a writer, it's a gift. So he's out there. Um, he's, he's about to go out and study the whales on his little boat. He goes and he videotapes them and identifies their whatever, observes their behavior. And uh, a whale comes ashore, alive. That's strange. These are volunteers who helped him in his research from uh, Earthwatch. And then another whale came ashore up the beach, and another one, and another one. And uh, if anyone has a copy of the book, if you look on the back cover, you can see where the whales all stranded. But there were 17 whales stranded, three different species of beaked whales. And um, I'll, I'll spare you. So, so he's probably the only person in the world who would have known, uh, number one, to suspect an acoustic event, number two, to know how to cut off the head of a beaked whale, which is actually difficult because they have no necks. You have to know exactly where the few, well, you have to cut right between the fused spine. They have seven vertebrae like all mammals, except they're fused into one bony knob. And he also had the presence of mind to drag the heads into a deep freeze of a conch fritter shack down the street where a friend of his ran. 
And so he had a, an evidence trail. And he also knew the guys in the Marine Mammal Division at ONR because they'd all gone to, to marine biology school together at uh, UC Santa Cruz back in the 70s. So um, he called him and said, listen, you got something big is going on here. And he went out on a plane. And in addition to finding lots of other whales on different beaches on off islands, he also saw some Navy destroyers and frigates. And so um, they sent down Darlene Ketton. The Navy sent down their, their top, uh, their ace uh, whale pathologist and, and hearing specialist who worked at, um, had dual appointments at Woods Hole and Harvard Medical School. And she CT scanned these heads. And I don't have a, I don't think I have a, oh yeah, I do. So this is blood they found pooling on bilaterally on both sides of the brain, and on all the specimens had the same evidence of what was clearly acoustic trauma, wasn't clear what, could have been an earthquake, could have been dynamite. Uh, those were subsequently investigated and found not to be the case. So the Navy needed to investigate it. Uh, they joined in a joint investigation with NOAA. I mean, I'm not gonna go into all the details, they're in the book, but suffice it to say, they first denied they were there, then they um, admitted they were there, but said they couldn't have been responsible because they, the, they were doing non-acoustic things. In fact, they were doing you know, war games. Where they were doing choke point exercises, which were you know, what was on the menu and what they needed to do. And this was a deep underwater canyon where they liked to do those. And because it was a deep underwater canyon, it filled with sound, and the whales had nowhere to go except ashore. And, uh, the ones who weren't eaten by sharks died on the beach. It was not a good scene. So in any case, and then Joel, um, Ken Balcom, after he delivered the, the whales to uh, Woods Hole, got closed out of the investigation. He was, didn't believe that they were going to investigate or at least share their investigation. So they, he went to a press conference and said, you know, basically became a whistleblower. So they did have an investigation. They did conclude that sonar was, in all likelihood, the cause of the stranding. And uh, that gave NRDC uh, a, a lot of ammunition to go to court against them. And um, in 2003, which was not a good time to go to court against the Navy, when we were at war in Iraq and Afghanistan by then. And, uh, but he was able to prevail and got a, what was called a permanent injunction. It was a five-year injunction, which was renewed five years later, of low-frequency active sonar, which is what the Navy had been doing in the EIS for for six years. So. Um, that led to a succession of other cases. I won't go through them all, but there were about five different lawsuits. It became apparent that mid-frequency was really the problematic technology, tended to be in these closed environments, tended to be with these deep diving animals. Um, and they continued to happen, unfortunately, and throughout the Canaries, the, the Spanish finally banned NATO from doing exercises there. So um, the Navy was in the habit of settling when they lost on the lower circuits, but uh, at a certain point, the fleet commanders got tired of the, the, uh, of the uh, uh, attorneys at the Justice Department who were representing them, losing on technicalities. Uh, they were mostly administrative technicalities, but they weren't technically in, in, in compliance. Though I, I should say, they were getting much more in compliance. I mean, in 1995, they weren't even acknowledging there were, there were regulations. Now they are, the Navy is essentially in compliance in the, this is my point, you know, the, the, the debates, what you're in court in now is really around the edges, and I'll talk about what that is. But in any case, um, they decided to uh, appeal it up through the circuits. They lost at every circuit, appeals, et cetera, and then they, uh, uh, they asked uh, the Supreme Court to hear the case. They agreed to hear the case, and they prevailed. The Navy prevailed. Uh, John Roberts wrote the decision, and um, the, the admirals expressed to me uh, a hope that this marked the end of death by injunction. Um, but it wasn't because the strandings continued as, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is an uh, orca in the Northwest who uh, crossed paths with a, uh, some kind of mine sweeping or mine exercise in Puget Sound. Uh, this is um, in uh, just exactly a year ago in Crete during a joint U.S. and um, uh, Greek, U.S., and Israeli navies. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm showing you these because these are the images that are being associated with the Navy, and they're widely distributed. So, so, let me, so where do you go from here? And that's, and, 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 and that's what I just want to address, and I want to share some ideas that mostly Navy people, some scientists have, have come to me with, and 
I'd like to hear your thoughts because I'm, I'm very interested in seeing if there's some place where there's traction, either on the sonar issue or on these other issues where the Navy can, can, can uh, get out of this box. So in terms of sonar, um, the main issue is seasonal and, and, and geographic exclusion. So just by way, this is really like the crux of the matter. So blue whales have made a big comeback, I don't know if you've heard, and they're coming into northern waters. Well, the blue whales, this is just off the coast of Southern California where the lawsuit is, and this is essentially, the, the blue whales are here in the summer. Um, so the Navy, I don't think is actually doing exercises in the summer, but they want the right to do them whenever they want, and they won't concede that. So the basic, I think, sticking point with environmental groups, it's this one lawyer, really, um, and is that, in, you know, they want to agree on some geographic exclusions and the Navy doesn't. And they seem common sense, but um, I'm not sure why the Navy doesn't want to, but I think that would get the Navy out of court. They could reach a really comprehensive settlement because there's really only one group and one lawyer they have to deal with, and he's wholly autonomous at NRDC. He doesn't have to get his board's approval, and, and I, I've heard a sentiment from some Navy admirals who I've spoken to saying, oh, they're never, they don't want this to be settled. They want this to go on and on. They make money off of it, they this and that, and, and I don't think that's the case. I think they would be delighted to come to a compromise, you could both declare victory and move on to other things. They have other fights to fight, uh, such as the oil and gas exploration on the East Coast. Um, some acousticians and, and a couple of uh, senior fleet, retired fleet officers said that there's really a role for more simulations. Uh, they use simulations, of course, for sonar training, and they can't totally replace sonar trainings with simulations, but um, they could be doing more, and that would also reduce energy costs and at sea costs, and would spare the habitat some of the noise. Um, and they could use, do more with their installed acoustic arrays. I mean, the Navy is, has, has made a great success on the East Coast of reviving the, the right whale. The Atlantic right whale is down, it's the most endangered species of whale in the world. There are only 500 of them. 10 years ago, there were only 300. And the reason they've made a recovery is because the Navy came up with a very cool acoustic, a passive acoustic monitoring program that prevents ship strikes, including their own ships, but not just their ships. They shared it with commercial ships, and lo and behold, they're not, they're not dying from ship strikes anymore. So if they could bring that to bear, uh, I would create a lot of goodwill, and they have a lot of installed sensors, passive sensors still, even though SOSIS has been largely deactivated. Um, and finally, uh, shipping. You know, I know this is a sensitive topic, the idea of sharing technology with industry that, that, that your adversaries might have access to. And, and what I don't know and you know, what I would suggest is, you know, my understanding is that there's always sort of a penumbrum, penumbra of, of classified material that's sort of on its way to declassification, but nobody's in a big hurry to do it. And there might be some technology worth sharing with shipping that could really bring down the noise level. That would be huge. Um, and or translate declassified technology into practice, really get involved actively with shipping to do that. And, and, and it's particularly where there are overlaps between uh, noise reduction and energy conservation would be great. That would be an incentive to, to the shippers. Um, and then in terms of seismic, uh, as I mentioned, they're doing this great satellite telemetry stuff. If they can continue to do that, keep that a priority rather, I mean, they're doing, the Navy's doing it because they want to map the oceans and it's much more efficient than crisscrossing them with a ship doing side scan sonar or air guns, but um, as I said, Phillips Conoco is in business with them on this, so I'm sure you know, it would reduce the seismic and it would allow you to operate on your East Coast ranges, for instance. And so you know, I, I know that I've, I've heard from Navy people that the Navy is lobbying. They're not getting out front on this issue, but they are letting their feelings be known about it, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of these uh, oil and gas uh, permits on the East Coast. And finally, I just want to close with the best news. The reason, one of the reasons it's worth getting involved in this effort is that unlike other forms of, of noise pollution, when you make sound sources of, of noise pollution, other, you know, unlike plastics that last for hundreds, thousands of years and toxins that, that take a long time, the pollution, the, the, the effects of the sound pollution go away as soon as you turn off the sound. So it's a, it's, a pretty clean, it's a pretty nifty cleanup if you can do it, even if it's just reductions. So um, anyway, thank you for your patience, and I'd really love to hear any 
well, questions, but also any thoughts you might have about any of those, any of those feasible. That's, you know, is there any feasible way the Navy could be, you know, get rid of the black eye and put on a white hat on this issue, um, you know, for its own self-interest and secondarily for the marine mammals.